as you all know, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. Uh, and actually, in fact, um, Elvis is a little bit older than, than 20 years, but we had some good reasons for deciding to celebrate it this year. And in fact, the, you know, as James mentioned, the, um, you could argue the first version of Elvis was this um, publication produced by, um, by BLDS in 1994. Uh, and uh, I know some of you remember was discussed at the ERD Information Management Working Group in Barcelona that year. Um, the first version of the website, I think, resulted, um, you know, came shortly after that meeting, um, and also as a result of the interaction with that ERD group, um, the first funding um, for Elvis began in 1996, which is why we've chosen to celebrate the anniversary um, this year. Um, there are some other good reasons, again, as James mentioned, um, to choose this point in time um, to really uh, reflect on what we've learned from, the, from, that, um, from those 20 years, from what we can remember anyway. Um, to look at the current landscape, look at what's going on in the world, um, think, you know, reflect, give us so, ourselves a little bit of time to reflect on you know, what are the things that are happening in the world that we really should be taking on board and be more aware of? Where are the opportunities and, and where are the challenges in that? Um, and what does that mean yeah, for where we go for the future, for the next 20 years? So that's really the motivation for, um, for us for bringing you all here today. Yeah, the, you'll hear shortly from Melissa, uh, we'll talk. Um, we'll talk a little. We'll talk a little bit about the sustainable development goals, and obviously, you know, that shift towards this new kind of focus for development around the SDGs um, is something that we need to be taking account of and thinking about. And as James also said, we need to be thinking about, you know, more practically for us as knowledge intermediaries, as knowledge brokers, um, you know, what's what are the business models? What are the sustainability models that will allow us to keep working um, to address the challenges and opportunities that we still think we face. Um, so, yeah, so what, so what, for those of you who don't know, I'll, maybe, I'll tell you a little bit about Eldis. The, the aim of Eldis, you know, expressed um, yeah, through the IDS strategy is to enhance the contribution of research evidence to addressing poverty, inequality and injustice. Um, in practical terms, if you go to the website, what that means is that Elvis very much focuses on the accessibility and the availability of research evidence for global audiences. Um, so you'll find um, access to a wide range of research <coughs> documents that are all free at the point of use, um, present a, you know, as broad as possible a diversity of perspectives on different issues. Um, and are structured and organised around kind of key themes and debates and development around you know, countries and regions that you might um, be looking for information on. So if you go to Elvis, you know, that's what you will see. Um, but underlying that are a whole set of values and approaches that really underpin the work that Elvis is doing. And these, these are um, listed here. So, you know, openness. Elvis has been a long-term advocate of, of open access and open access publishing. Um, and it comes, you know, very strongly from this idea that knowledge is a global public good and that should be freely available to everyone that can use it. Um, fundamentally, though, I think if you ask me what Elvis is about, I'd say it's about addressing inequality, it's about equity. Um, specifically, inequality in the accessibility of research for different audiences globally, um, but also inequality in the ability of researchers and research organisations to get their message, to get their knowledge out to as wide an audience as possible. And uh, yeah, that's very much underpinned what Elvis tries to do through, um, yeah, certainly through the, the our recent history. Um, relevance. 
is a key thing for elders. By that we mean um, you know, sharing diverse, timely, evidence-based information, but in accessible ways and in appropriate formats that are adapted to the specific context of the audiences um, that will be able to use them. So that you know, ultimately we have the maximum impact in the work that we do. Um, innovation also, you know, making use of new technologies, new ways of working, new approaches as they emerge, trying those out, trying to use those to find innovative ways and innovative products and services. Um, we use this phrase, the thoughtful use of technology, which I'll come back to. Um, and key to that also, um, collaboration. Um, we try to work in ways that support others working in our sector. Um, we try to support research producers to get their knowledge out to audiences. We try to work with other intermediaries, other knowledge brokers, other people working in this knowledge sharing world. Um, so I think, you know, if you, if you see how this is the website, you see the content, I think um, what I'm trying to stress is the underlying that and this whole set of values and approaches and things that ultimately we're trying to leverage that digital platform and that digital content to help us to achieve. Um, so, so what have we learnt? Oh, this has been so hard, I have to say. <laughs> to, to, uh, I should have really given myself a bit longer than 20 minutes to try and talk about 20 years of, of learning from Elvis and to try and work out the key areas to focus on that's been keeping me awake at night for ages. So, but I thought probably the way to do it is to try to reflect a little bit on what we've learned based around some of these kind of key values in the future. Um, so around openness. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good news, I think, um, on this. Uh, since, you know, Elvis is, and we can't claim responsibility for this, um, perhaps some minor contribution, but um, since Elvis has started, you know, open access has taken off in a big way. There's now widespread support in the research community, at least, for open access publishing. Um, we've, uh, you'll hear a bit more later on, but we've been in preparation for this, um, we've been conducting a little survey. Um, and then we asked a few questions around open access of the, of the audiences of that survey. And from the responses that we got, you know, around 92% of the people that responded to the survey, the, their organisations have used open access journals as a way of publishing um, their outputs. And for 38%, you know, reasonably high proportion, that's now their usual practice to do that. I think that's a big move forward from um, you know, where we were started. In terms of digital online repositories, um, arguably even better news, 93% of the respondents to our survey um, you know, have deposited or do deposit their research in repositories. And for 68% of those, that's now what they would consider their usual practice. I think that, you know, we don't have a baseline survey to compare that against, but I think that's um, you know, a significant proportion. And that's really good news. And that's how, and in terms of, for Eldis, what that's meant is that we've been able to shift focus a little bit over our history. So we've moved away from um, having to focus so much on, purely on making research available in digital spaces. There are now you know, uh, really kind of systematic, programmatic ways for organisations to do that that have to some extent replaced the need um, for us to focus on that. So where we focused more effort increasingly is on the discoverability then of that information once it is available um, digitally online. Um, so you know, leveraging our kind of digital infrastructure, the, the way in which we mark up content and keywords and you know, ad structure to make it um, more easy to find for policymakers, researchers, and practitioners. That yeah, you know, we have to accept largely a typing search terms into Google. Um, <coughs> however, you know there is still strong evidence that 
um, the adoption of open access practice and the benefits that can be gained from that is very uneven. Um, I'm not going to say much more about that because we're going to hear from two much more expert speakers than me on that later in the day, which is Mason and, and Williams. Um, but yeah, there is clear evidence from the work that we've been doing that you know, the benefits of open access aren't being really, be realised equally um, across the board. Um, so in terms of equity, clearly that's a, you know, that's a, a remaining issue. And the same can be said, actually, um, around technology. Um, you know, there are um, advances in technology, the adoption of standards, um, different approaches that have enormous potential to help us to address the problems of inequality of access, inequality of visibility of, of global knowledge. Um, but you know, in terms of the, the creation of knowledge, discoverability, accessibility, visibility and shareability. Um, you know, there are really exciting technologies out there that can help us with so, semantic web technologies, things like content mining, which is now becoming um, you know, a more widespread and more kind of common practice. Um, the adoption of things like um, you know, unique identifiers like DOIs and ORCID IDs. You know, these things hold enormous potential to help people to find information more easily. Um, but again, adoption of these is highly uneven um, and tends to be concentrated around larger, better resourced organisations, primarily in Europe and, and North America. And the reasons for this, you know, some are obvious resources access to the kind of technical capacity to make these systems work. But I think our, you know, our recent experience is that it's a more complicated picture than that, actually. There's something which is around, um, you know, where's the leadership for um, organisations to adopt these new approaches? Where's that coming from? Why is it that the leadership exists in some sectors and not in others, in some organisations and not in others? Um, and is there something about scale? You know, when we opened up um, all of the eldest content um, through an API, you know, as open licensed um, content, we found it quite hard to do. As you know, as a medium-sized, well-resourced development organisation in the UK, it's not an easy thing. Um, so <coughs> clearly, that's the case for other organisations. If you don't have the volume of content, the volume of um, information to drive, um, to drive you to do that, um, then obviously it makes it harder. So I think there's something around scale, um, yeah, and you see the organisations that have really taken on these technologies are the ones that have really large sets of essentially data sets to make available. Um, and our work on GOC has been to try to, on the Open Knowledge Hub, as you call it, um, has been to um, try to, um, if you like, bring together smaller organisations in a collective way to create the kind of critical mass of content that um, helps to overcome that, um, that problem of scale. Um, but we need to understand what's going on here better, I think. I think you know, um, we'd be happy to say that we haven't quite got to the bottom of what's going on there. And it's something we'd like to look into more. Um, so on relevance, um, yeah, I think the, the one really clear, I had one bit of really clear learning to present from Elvis, it would be that there is demand for local, locally produced knowledge. Um, and we can show that very clearly. And I'm going to try and show it, not very clearly, with two not very clear maps. But, so the, the top map is, um, this is Elvis's you know, global audience fairly well distributed you know, centres that you know, Elvis is primarily in English, so it's centre plan in English speaking world primarily, but quite well distributed. Um, if we, we partner with um, currently I think around Tracy will know currently around sixty research producing organisations globally to profile their research and we do some analysis of who 
is using the research from them that we produce. And this is something I presented recently um, for Spark in Nigeria. Um, so this is Spark Nigeria's content and where it's been used on Elvis. And you know, not surprisingly, it's most, mostly been used in Nigeria. So although you know, um, Elvis is a global platform sitting in Sussex, um, the majority of the use of research being produced in Nigeria is in Nigeria. And um, I think there's something really interesting in that. And what, um, you know, I think what we've realised is that perhaps Eldis isn't the best organisation, actually, to be making that research contextually relevant to that audience. Um, and so we've done a lot in recent years to also try to partner with, um, yeah, with local intermediaries, with local organisations, who understand that context better, who are able to um, package and um, promote that underlying knowledge in a way which is more adaptive and more relevant to those particular contexts. Um, so, you know, to be relevant, we think, requires partnerships. Um, so, as I said, you know, we've made all of Elvis's content open, one of the key drivers for that was so that it was, a, it was available for those other organisations, those other intermediaries to take and repackage um, in, way, yeah, in their own way. Um, so that there's been a kind of technological driver of what that um, learning around context means. But there's also been a very strong driver around the, the importance and the value of collaborative work. And, and you know, I, I hope that we've helped a lot of organisations. We've partnered with over 100 organisations now over the 20 years that Elvis has existed. I hope we've helped a lot of those organisations to, you know, to improve um, their own practice and their own ways of working. I'm also certain that we've learned a huge amount ourselves from working with those organisations in, in, in how we work and you know, in our um, improving our ways of working um, and actually I think you know ultimately the real value of what Eldis does isn't the number of visitors we get to the website and number of downloads that we get the real value of Eldis I think now lies in and the real quality in what we do lies in that collaboration and in those partnerships um, and to some extent I think we made a mistake um, in the way in which we presented our work back to the world, particularly to the organisations and the donors that support Elvis. We've continued in, in some ways to focus too much on, you know, it's great to be able to say, we've had a million visitors or we've, uh, you know, we've had a million downloads. I think actually those numbers aren't really what's important. Um, what we should have spent more time on and got better at is working out how to measure and present back the value of those partnerships and the value of that collaborative work. Um, right, I'm walking on a bit, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, so, where do we go next? Um, <laughs> do we need to reassess some of those kind of values <coughs> that we've had over the last um, that we've evolved over the last 20 years? Um, well, yes and no, I think probably is the answer. We've um, clearly, and you know, Melissa will talk a bit more about this, this new framing of development, the, you know, the, the SDGs as a driver, um, gives us some food for thought. In particular, the, um, you know, I think there's an implicit um, value placed on local knowledge within the SDGs process. What we need to do is we need to really make that explicit. Um, and to do that, we need to really nail down why is it that local knowledge isn't reaching the audience, isn't having the impact that it should be having, um, and how do we address that? What's Eldis's role in that, if you like? Um, I think there's also something in our values that in some ways, we're a little bit compartmentalised in thinking about knowledge sharing in its, as a kind of standalone 
activity and actually I think what we need to be doing um, is embedding that much more within the whole production of process of production of knowledge. So talking less about um, open access and more about open research and open science. Um, talking less about knowledge sharing and more about knowledge creation. Um, but ultimately, you know, we want to talk to you about what you think um, you know, should be our focus and that's very much been um, the driver for us for organising this event and you know, once again it's great to see you all here. Um, so that, I think that's all I want to say on that really. Hopefully that introduces us nicely to the process for today. Um,